Hello? Steve! Hi, you right? Wait, wait, what? The show's today! It starts in five minutes! I've got to get there now. Alright, I'll be there as soon as I can. Hello, hello, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Welcome to the show. As always, we're the place to go if you want to get in the know. Okay, 2016 is finally over. Welcome to the new year. So the main topic for tonight is conspiracy theories, who I'll be discussing with conspiracy expert Timothy Phillips. Also, on tonight's show, we'll be looking at the mysterious Mandela effect, peering into the secrets of Jay's grave, and I'll be showing you an exclusive interview and performance by the wonderful Sadie Haller to end the show. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, it's none other than Mr. Timothy Phillips. Hi, Ozzy. Great Hi, to be here. It's brilliant to have you on the show. Please take a seat thank for me. Thank you so much. So how are you anyway? I'm great, thank you. Yourself? Brilliant. I'm not too bad. So Tim, um, you claim to be one of Britain's top experts uh, in conspiracy theories, if that's right. Yes, well, I mean, I've been working in the field for several years now and I'm well regarded by the community at large. You could say that I'm somewhat of an expert. Okay, so tell us, um, Tim, for those viewers at home that are watching, um, what is a conspiracy theory? Well, Ozzy, a conspiracy theory is the belief of those who are able to see in the cracks of an otherwise normal story. That some covert but influential organisation or paranormal force is responsible for an unexplained event. Okay, so can you give us an example, possibly? Well, I think the most famous example is the uh, moon landing of 1969, which was uh, said to be faked by the government. There are many pieces of unexplained uh, evidence that backs up this claim, including eyewitness reports claiming to, uh, for people to see astronauts in that specific time period, which I find fascinating. Okay, well that is quite an interesting one, the mm. moon landing. Okay, well let's move on to look at the mysterious Mandela effect, which is a topic that everyone at the moment is talking about. Now, to tell us more about it, we sent one of our on-field uh, presenters um, to go and have a look into the Mandela effect uh, earlier this week. Uh, take a look at this. <laughs> The Mandela Effect. It is a phenomenon that has taken the internet by storm. It is a theory that suggests that alternate universes exist. I want to find out if there is any truth behind it. The Mandela Effect, or Emmy for short, is a sharing of a false memory of a past by a group of people. Now, what does this have to do with Nelson Mandela himself? Not a lot, really. But in 2010, the Mandela Effect first came online for the first time when a woman named Fiona Broom first came up with it at DragonCon. She and a bunch of her friends thought that Nelson Mandela had died in the 80s in his cell, when in fact he did not. The next point on our timeline is 2012, where the Berenstain Bears pop up. A man named Reese, who is a physicist, said, that instead of it being the Berenstein Bears, it is actually the Berenstain Bears, because our brains thought that it was E instead of A, so in fact it is actually A and not E. He believes this is because the universe shifts every so often, which allows for an alternate reality to take place where instead of it being the Berenstein Bears, it is the Berenstain Bears. There are people who believe that it is actually the brain that is at fault, and it is our memories that are playing us up because our memory is not as good as we think it is. 
Other people believe it is society, and misconceptions based on culture can actually lead to the Mandela effect taking root in our daily lives. <laughs> Let's have a look at the Mandela effect in action, shall we? Right, so my first point of interest for this Mandela effect is the show Sex and the City. Not sex in the city, mind you, because that is a common misconception from the Mandela effect. There is a proof video on the internet of a man finding the Mandela effect in Sex and the City. Most people in the world believe a show is actually meant to be called Sex in the City, when in actuality it is called Sex and the City. I want proof of the Mandela effect, besides some bullshit Photoshop pictures. Sex in the city. No question what it used to be. Hard fucking evidence. How weird is that, huh? Anyway, let's move on. The next point of interest. We are the champions. The song by Queen, that is very good. But, how does it end? Well, let me answer that for you. It ends simply as we are the champions. Now you might think, oh, really, it must end with of the world. Well, that has been disproven. Lots of people think it has ended with of the world, but instead it is just ending as we are the champions, as proven by James Corden in his karaoke video, where he goes around with celebrities singing songs in his car. They actually talk about in the show wondering where the other world part is in the end of that video. Of the world. Crazy. That's, that's really sort of that's really rough, man. Anyway, let's move on to my final example, The Wizard of Oz, a brilliant film about a girl who gets whisked away to a magical place. But is it as magical as people say it is? Maybe not. Because there is a scene in that film where the scarecrow of the film has a gun. Don't believe me? Look at this image. There he is, right there, with a gun. He's pointing it as they're walking through the evil woods. Now that's a scarecrow I would not like to cross. Is the Mandela Effect a real thing? Ultimately, the argument cannot be won. The very existence of a Mandela Effect means that there should be no tangible evidence. No version of a change would be existent, only our shared memory would remain. I believe that the explanation lies in the brain and our memory, but I don't think will ever really know. Okay, well, thanks for that, Joe. Um, as ever, he gives us a brilliant analysis. Uh, so, Tim, uh, what did you make of that? Well, I thought it was really interesting, Ozzy. I mean, we all fall into the trap of the Mandela effect at some point in our lives, whether or not uh, we want to. Very true. Uh, okay, well, Joe, like I said, gave us a great insight into uh, the Mandela effect and how it works. Uh, but I want um, to test it, uh, see if it basically really works. So, um, Tim, I've got seven questions here for you. Okay. And it's what we're going to do, as you're an expert yourself, to test if it actually works. These are examples of the Mandela effect, uh, and you're going to see if you uh, knew them or thought otherwise, okay? So, question number one then. Does Kit Kat have a dash? Do yes, it does. In the bar? Yep. Okay, you're saying yes, it does. Crazy enough, guys, it actually doesn't. Okay, question number two. Is the Mona Lisa smiling or emotionless? Yeah, I definitely think she's smiling in that one. Uh, that is absolutely correct. Um, she is smiling just about, uh, but a lot of people think she's emotionless. Question number three. Uh, does the Monopoly man have a monocle or not? Definitely. I definitely yep. think so, yeah. Uh, the actual answer, in fact, is that he doesn't have a monocle. A lot of people, again, think wow. that he does. Question number four. Is the tip of Pikachu's tail black? I'm going to go with yes as well for that one. Okay, you're saying yes. Uh, the answer is actually no, uh, it's yellow tail. Um, question number five. Does Darth Vader ever say, Luke, I'm your father in, in Star Wars? Have you ever seen Star Wars? Oh, yes, I'm a massive fan. Um, I think he definitely does, yeah. 
Uh, in fact, he says, no, I'm your father, not Luke, I'm your father. So slightly different. Um, and even even the man wow. who plays Darth Vader himself thought it was Luke, I'm your father, and he said it, you know. So that's very odd. Question number six. Who says, beam me up, Scotty, in Star Trek? Uh, um, I have to be honest, I've never actually seen Star Trek, so... Okay. Well, we to answer that one. Uh, the answer, Tim, is that no one says it. A lot of people think it's uh, Spock. Um, and finally, uh, spell Looney Tunes for me. L O O N E Y T double O N S. Uh, well, a lot of people think it is du the double O, but it's actually T U N E S. Oh, um, wow. T double O N S. Fascinating. Very fascinating stuff. Um, Okay, so, uh, well, it's interesting. You didn't know all the answers uh, to those questions. Yeah. Um, very interesting how the Mandela effect works. Now, um, but just to prove it actually does work on everyone, uh, basically, uh, last week, I decided to go out in the streets of Exeter and ask the public these same questions. Uh, so let's take a look and see uh, what they said. Hello there. Um, I'm here live um, in Exeter. And today, um, I'm going to be going around uh, talking to the general public about basically the Mandela effect and what they know about it. And, uh, and yeah, we'll just see some, some good answers and see what we get uh, for the Aussie Gilbert show. All right, let's do this. Are you all right there, guys? Can I have a quick chat? You all right? Uh, we just want to basically ask a few questions for our... TV show, well it's my t TV show, the Oz Gilbert show. Alright, so okay. um, basically I just want to know, um, I'll just go around and ask you all quickly, do you know much about the Mandela effect, like conspiracy theories, that kind of thing, have you heard about it, any of you? I know that, Sorry? I know that there's a conspiracy theory that 9-11 was done by Bush, but that's it. Okay, all right, well, yeah, that is one. It's called the Mandela Effect because in 2013, Mandela died, um, and basically a lot of people think that he died before that, um, in the prison or something like that. So that's how it works, um, and I'm going to now give you examples and just test you guys to see what you think, and you might find it's actually a bit, a bit unusual how it works. So we'll go around all of you. So the Mona Lisa, is she emotionless or smiling? Would you see her as she's definitely emotionless surely that's subjective she's slightly smiling yeah she's smiling I believe she's no she's kind of like no, she's I don't know I can't like distinguish like, between the memes I've seen of like her and like the actual smiling. painting <laughs> the, the, the copyrighted I version don't, I think she's smirking I think <laughs> it's opinion and you yeah, can take it whichever way you look at it um, she is actually smiling uh, it's classed as it's smiling. Really it's a sort of more of a smirk. The painter. <laughs> you don't know. No, but it's cl they, they call it a smile. It's not emotionless, is it? That's what we know. It is not emotionless. So I'm with um, this kind gentleman. Um, sorry, what is your name? If you like to tell us. Andy. Andy. Nice to meet you, Andy. Does Kit Kat um, have a dash in between Kit and Cat on the bar? No. You say no. Yeah. Is actually spot on, ladies and gentlemen, because it doesn't. But see, a lot of people think it does, so um, that's how it works. Um, okay, so what do you know about Mandela Effect? I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what, know what it is. Is it like Febreze isn't spelled with two E's? <laughs> is that not something about it? Yes, that, that, yeah, that is a Mandela Effect example right there, exactly. So you do know what it is. Um, is the tip of Pikachu's tail black? Um, his ears are black, but is the tail black as well, would you say? I don't know. Yeah. What are you saying? Yeah. I thought it was yellow, but I don't know. Yes. So. <laughs> oh, he's got black ears. He's got black no, ears. That, yeah. yeah, he no, does. He's have got a yellow tail. Yeah, he does. I've got a toy of him at home, so I should know this. But I think he know. does. No. Okay. I would say no. Um, he actually doesn't. So, yeah. Okay, last question then. Um, can you s spell for me? Um, you've probably seen it, the cartoon um, animation Looney Tunes. How would you spell that? Looney Tune is spelled S A U Y. I think that's how you spell it. Sorry, say that again. S A U Y. S. Wait, what? S A U Y. L U N E T U N E S. No. T O O N E S. No, see, that's not how you spell it. It's actually like you said, tunes. T U N E S. So it's like, even though they're cartoons, it's Looney Tunes. You get, it's a bit, it's a bit weird that one. Yeah. Very clever. Okay, I think that's all we've got time for. All right, thank um, you. But thanks a lot, girls. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
Okay, so it turns out most people thought that something existed that actually never did. Uh, they go months, even years, being under the false impression of reality. It's a very unusual thing. Uh, what do you think about it? Well, I think that's quite interesting and like we've proven, it is something that happens every day. Okay, um, now let's move on to discuss um, quite a, an interesting conspiracy theory, uh, which is the secrets of Jay's grave on Dartmoor. Uh, now, first of all, tell us a bit about sort of what it is, Tim. Well, Jay's grave is just a story about a, uh, I think it's a young orphan girl who uh, fell pregnant and it was just shamed upon in those times. So I think she was murdered and then buried somewhere where they place someone place uh, flowers there every day. Um, apparently it's a fairy as well, so I'm not too sure about that one. Okay, well that is uh, quite interesting, especially it happened locally. Um, well, we have a clip here um, to basically show you a bit more about uh, what it is uh, with Dan, um, our reporter. Take a look. Throughout the years, there have been many stories, and the most well-known tells the tale of a young orphan woman who fell in love with the farmer's son, which resulted in her pregnancy. After becoming branded as a slut, she hung herself in a barn. Back in the 18th century, it was all that suicide victims were not allowed to be buried in consecrated ground. Instead, they were buried at a crossroad. This is because Christians believed that suicide was a sin, so therefore, alongside criminals, they buried their bodies at a crossroad. Ever since, fresh flowers have been left on the grave daily. However, no one knows who'd buy, but locals claim to have seen a hooded figure. After studying the surrounding area and speaking with local folk, we sat with a camera triggered by movement near the grave to reveal the truth about these rumours. And what we found is quite remarkable. Back to you in the studio, Ozzy. I've been Dan Milt. Thank you. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, so I think now that is then all we've got time for on conspiracy theories. Uh, thanks again, uh, Tim, for coming on the show. Yes, it's been so an welcome. absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you for um, having me. That's no problem at all. Personally, I've learned a lot from it as well. Um, it's certainly it's been very interesting. Okay, now to end off the show, uh, this is an interview and performance with none other than Sadie Hall of Haller. Um, this is a must watch. Check it out. Hi, so I'm with um, Sadie Haller then. It's great to have you here. My first question of today is uh, what made you become a singer in the first place, really? Um, so I've always loved to sing, like ever since I was little. Um, and I picked up the guitar when I was in like year eight or nine. So when I was like 12 or 13, um, I've always loved singer songwriters. Um, and I just thought as soon as I played the guitar, it was just like, oh, I'd love to do music. It's really cool. My next question then, uh, what gives you inspiration uh, when writing your songs? Um, it's just like surroundings really, like um, I wrote a song about the Royal Clarence which was devastating, um, just like sayings, someone, one of my friends said that they like to dance barefoot in the rain and I thought that was really cool so I decided to write a song about that and just like kind of like just friends and family and just like everything around which you just see on like a daily basis. Um, right, now let's talk about um, some of your new stuff, really. Mm -hmm. um, we're sort of going into 2017, so let's talk a bit about that. So, Two for Joy, sort of where did that come about? Um, I think, do you do this, you did the album in 2015, is that 16. right? 2016, sorry, yeah. So, yeah, so just basically just go through the tracks. Um, we'll start with Two for Joy, and what made you uh, do that song, um, and, and what does it what does it mean, really? Um, well, Two for Joy is obviously like a saying, one for sorrow, two for joy, about a magpie. That's why they call it Two for Joy, because magpies mate for life. So, Didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. You learn something new every day. Um, right. What is your favourite song on there, would you say? Or do you just like them all as much as each other? Um, what are you most proud of? I think, musically, I quite like the way Dancing Barefoot's been played. Just like the way how it's not just me and my guitar. I really like the other instruments in that. So your album is, like, just for the viewers watching the show, um, if they do want to download that or 
um, buy that? How how can they go about it? Um, so you can get it on iTunes, it's on Spotify, like uh, CD Baby, so all the digital stores. And if you want a hard copy, you can email me or message me on Facebook. Okay. Um, it's very kind of you to um, give us an exclusive um, song that you have performing for us today. Um, so what, what is that going to be and why have you chosen it? So this is called Graceful Until the End and it's a song which I did write about the fire um, and I did perform it at the Phoenix when it was the Extra Fire Appeal gig. Brilliant, cool. Um, well, without further ado, um, this is Sadie Haller. Um, thanks a lot for the interview um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing this performance. Cool. <laughs> Okay, well that's all we have time for. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'll be back next week. At the same time, uh, we'll have another fun-filled facts show to look forward to. But until then, thanks for watching. Take care. Good night.